today on Owl Have You Know. Now, half of our business is about encouraging leaders and helping them articulate their purpose, mission, vision, values, and behaviors, and helping them activate that within their cultures. I'm David Drew Gleaver, Rice Business Class of 2012, full-time. I wanted to welcome um, here today, Bethany Andell, the fearless leader of Savage Brands and also president of the board of directors of the alumni crew. Uh, Bethany, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you, David. Glad to be here. Also a full-timer. So you and I are a simpatico in that way. You know, this this format is is quick and punchy. So and we really want to dive into uh, who you are, obviously uh, learn a lot about your business and just get a good feel of of what you're all about. Um, so the idea here is to to cast a message to the broader alumni group, as well as active students as well, or maybe even people that are thinking about joining up into the Rice Business uh, crew, if you will, so our ecosystem. So so Bethany, I want to just start us off here, and I hope this isn't too much of a canned question, but tell us a little bit about what you're all about and what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? Well, I know this is going to sound somewhat lofty, and I'm going to, I'm going to pass over the you know traditional, oh, my kids uh, get me up out of bed in the morning and focus on what I'm passionate about, which is corporate America. And really my mission is to get capitalism back in a place where people trust and respect and love business. And I know that's a tall order, but that's what I'm about. That's what my business is about. Uh, I think it's dire uh, for America that we bring back consciousness to capitalism and prove our place again. Hmm. What is it about this time in humanity and the world and the pandemic even that makes that message so relevant today? Well, I believe to my core that business is a force for good. And, you know, perhaps the the greed of the very few that gets the attention has destroyed most business people's reputation and capitalism itself. And I would argue that most leaders of businesses are people that respect people and put humanity first and that their businesses, the value that they provide actually can have a very positive impact on the world and how that relates right now. It just is a crazy time. I just am laughing is. is, you know, this is the time through coronavirus, through even what's happening in energy market, which is very real and palpable in Houston right now is that leaders are being tested against their values. So, you know, going back just a little bit, you've got all these companies with their values posted on the break room, you know, walls on posters and they're announced in the town hall. They might be listed on a website, but in times like this in crisis is where leadership is really tested to see if they are demonstrating and committed to the values that they've put out there for their employees and the way they've described how their company is going to be, what they're going to stand for right now is where you're going to see all of that happening, that credibility being created for all of the great leaders that really do abide by their values. So I'm, I'm excited, you know, as horrible as this is, the opportunist in me says so many great leaders are going to come to light here and the Harvard business reviews and the, you know, that we're studying at Rice, you know, we're going to read about how leaders showed up during this exact moment. And I hope that I'm one of those people Mm. for my team. You just said a lot there. Try to unpack that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I told you I'm passionate. If you get me going, I can't stop. Um, Going back to capitalism and, you know, trying to, Try a balance here between getting to know you and not getting too into the politics, so to speak. But it, I think it'd be remiss to not ask, given that everyone that's gone through business school is essentially an adherent to capitalism. So do you feel like capitalism in a lot of ways has lost its way? Well, I do. And the most simple way I can put it is that somehow along the way, we've put profit at the front end of the equation. 
And the reality is that profit is the byproduct. It is the outcome of having great people that are serving a mission that are performing well. And if you've got those two things happening, then your profit should multiply. So I believe that consciousness in business, values, motivation, shared vision, having a very clear core purpose that motivates people. And there's all sorts of reading you can do on this. And it's not just theory, it's proven that those companies that live that way will do better and they will be more sustainable into the future. If you think about Southwest Airlines, which is the poster child, right? Uh, very clear about who they are, very clear on their values, live on their values, unrelenting. And they're the only airline, well, I should check the numbers today with COVID, but they're the only airline that's gone through its history in the black. So that says something. Indeed. And, and Southwest is a great example. And rest in peace, Herb Kelleher, uh, very recently. Do you feel like, uh, you know, that there's going to be an impact there with him not being around? And do you feel like other folks are going to be taking his reins in terms of executing on that core mission of Southwest? I believe that their leadership and incoming leadership and cult, their culture is so indoctrinated that they can last. They can persevere without her. And I think they're going to be just fine. You're touching on a couple of things that are very near and dear to my heart. So I spent a couple of years at Salesforce and there is an iconic leader there. And if, for folks that know is Mark Benioff. So he's a big uh, proponent of business being a force for good, as you had said, and that business is really not so much about the shareholder, but about the stakeholders, which includes the shareholders and also everything that touches the ecosystem of the business. Is that a philosophy that you ascribe to as well? Have you maybe connected with Mark Benioff or maybe share in some of his philosophies and, and use that in and running your for running your business? The answer is yes, it's called the technical term stakeholder orientation. I'm sure that Rice, uh, and I believe that uh, they are in maybe ethics talking more about this, but the the notion of that is that all stakeholders can win. It's a win-win-win. If you have a business strategy that creates a trade-off between stakeholders, it's a bad business strategy. And when you're thinking about how you can have all of your stakeholders, be it the community, be the environment as a stakeholder, be it your employees, your partners, your customers, your investors then you get a lot more creative and innovative with how the business is going to operate. And ultimately that can differentiate you. So we're seeing a lot more of that. The business roundtable in the fall set out a letter that basically said the sole purpose of a business is no longer about shareholder primacy. Investors for, you know, shareholder value is, is the end all be all, but more about the stakeholder orientation that you just discussed. So yes, I live that in my own firm. Love that. And definitely want to hear more about how that manifests itself in your own firm and how you go about your own way of leading and living out those those values. What would you say to a business leader that would look askance at what you had just said and would say, well, if I don't prioritize the bottom line and I prioritize other stakeholders and other perhaps externalities outside of the business, then my business would suffer my people would suffer and we just wouldn't be sustainable as a business if we didn't focus completely on the bottom line, which I'm sure you've heard a lot. So what would be some of your overarching principles that you rely on or your go-to for folks that may not be in alignment with your philosophy or otherwise <laughs> preaching the gospel that you're preaching? You know, it's interesting that you bring this up because I think there is a little bit of a misunderstanding of what kind of the term conscious capitalism and stakeholder orientation and thinking about this, having a purpose-led business. There's a lot of different ways it's being talked about. No one is saying we shouldn't make money, right? And the way I've heard it described before is, you know, in your body to live, you must have oxygen and blood pumping through it. In a corporation, you must have money. You must have a healthy you know, financial statement to succeed over time, but it doesn't represent who you are. The blood and the oxygen in my body is only that. It's helping the body function. The money does that. If I am healthy and happy and with people and very clear on what my own personal values and purpose are, that starts to form who I am and what I'm known for. 
And that makes me overall a more healthy, sustainable person. So if you think about a living organism, you can start to kind of just think about it that way. And it makes a lot of sense. I love money as much as anybody else. I'm not in my business not to make money. I'm not in my business to give away everything for free. And not all of my work, you know, that I do is, you know, revolutionizing corporate America as our mission statement says. But I hope to work with people that want to see that and want their people to be happy. And we spend, you know, most of our lives in the office place. If I can inspire my employee base and my culture, then ultimately I believe that differentiates my company. And if I have a differentiated company and culture, people stay with me. And if people stay with me, they're going to deliver a much better service to our customers. And then our customers are going to stay with me and I'm going to make more money than the next person. So that's, it's kind of more of a tribal attitude of, you know, wanting to be in it together, wanting to create a difference and wanting to attract like-minded people. Hmm. This message that you've been talking about for seemingly a long time seems almost way ahead of its time in a lot of ways, assuming that you've been consistent with this message, almost sort of even predicting something like a pandemic and COVID-19, right? Because now this idea of conscious capitalism and reaching outside of the, you know, the walled gardens of your own company seems to be that much more relevant because people are hurting, other small mom and pop businesses are are suffering, folks are filing for unemployment, and it's just really, really, really tough time. So so given what your message is, and given that there seems to be no insight in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, what is it that you would recommend or are doing yourself as a leader of Savage Brands to engage with the broader community and help to mitigate the pain and hurt and suffering that is a result of COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I'd say often we think about communicating to our employees and keeping them kind of up to date on you know, what's happening with the company or what's happening with our clients or what's happening with our sales and marketing efforts and those things. And I have found two things have been tremendous. One is to find ways to activate your employees. Can they do things in service for your clients or for your suppliers to help them through these times? And they come up with all sorts of great ideas. And so we've been working, you know, for instance, you know, Without even asking, my creative team came up with all of these custom go back to the office or go back to the work safety stickers and floor decals with social distancing. And they just did that on their own. And now we're able to share those. We're sharing them with, you know, with our clients and with our suppliers and with our friends that they can go do. We're not making money off of that, but we sure are building relationships. And it's also creating a lot of connection and camaraderie inside of my company with my team. And I think that we're all going to be a lot tighter as a group coming out of it. So that's just an example of how, you know, use the power of your people. They've got great minds. They're creative right now. They've got a lot of anxiety. So it's great to get in front of them and, you know, put them on a project and say, hey, let's just, you know, come up with some wacky ideas and see if something's going to going to stick. And then how can we bring that out into the world and share what we know? I love the wacky ideas. Uh, so the permission to be wacky, right, is is really fantastic. It reminds me of back in uh, business school. Uh, so Professor Kim Kimmy, who is the communications professor, had this really great exercise where we were doing some brainstorming and had given sticky notes to everyone. The idea is that if you just ask what's your you know crazy wacky idea or whatever is like bobbling around in your head, that people are withdrawn otherwise wouldn't share their ideas in front of everyone. But if you pass out a bunch of sticky notes and had everyone write it down prior to asking everyone what their ideas were, and then just grabbing all those and then grouping them on a on a whiteboard, then you get the best of breed ideas because people are are thinking independently and unilaterally. I only wish that that was sort of the part of the modus operandi of of business meetings, but it doesn't tend to work that way. <laughs> but really quickly on the brainstorming, yeah. um, just for anyone that's listening, that's trying to get a good brainstorm going, be it about COVID or through this time or just even later, we have indoctrinated in our company that there are no bad ideas in brainstorming. So it's actually basically consequence if you make some fun of somebody's idea, if you just poo-poo the idea, or if you use the word, but like, oh, that's, that sounds like a great idea, but you need to use the word and that's a great idea. And what if we thought about this as well? 
So just, you know, you want to make sure that some rules of engagement when you go into brainstorming, because you're right, people will shirk away because they'll be afraid that their idea is seen as stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, going back to the conscious camp capitalism and thinking about our coursework um, when we were in business school, if you could just pull out a magic wand and insert or modify the uh, curriculum of, of rice business as a function of the philosophy that you're um, putting forward here, what sort of course would you want to be part of the core curriculum at, at Rice Business School? Me personally, and actually it was, so, it was so funny in a board meeting, we were like, oh, what class, you know, if you could go back and take any class, what would you do? And all of us agreed that we should have listened more in organizational behavior. So shout out to Jennifer George, who was our prof at the time. We should have listened to you, Jennifer. I apologize if I wasn't fully engaged. I think that there needs to be a lot more attention to purpose and values. I think that values a lot of times gets buried in the, in the you know, in ethics class. And if we could really think about the curriculum and have how we're showing up as leaders, how you define your own personal purpose, how you define your own personal values, how you think about what you want your own brand reputation to be, whether you're working in a, in a company or starting your own company, and having that be the overlay for the entire two years. So it's not necessarily a curriculum at that point, but it's so critical to any sort of leadership. If you think of, close your eyes and think of your favorite teacher, your favorite boss. If you think about your favorite brands, a lot of times the leader at the top has set that direction. And so I, I just think there's a huge opportunity and it runs across the entire curriculum. It's not a specific class. Mm -hmm. And then I would shape some more communications to be less about how you write an email and how you do some of those things to what Kim talks about, right? Which is, you know, how you're shaping new ideas, how you're engaging others into shaping more ideas, how you're communicating as a leader and how you're listening as a leader. And then uh, the other is just more on culture overall. I would be remiss to not ask you to, you know, totally switch topics here about your family business and Savage Brands. I folks would be very interested, especially when you have a family business. You go to, um, you know, business school and that whole journey. If you could maybe skim across the the pond and turn, and kind of paint that arc of a narrative, how that all started, how you went about the decision process, how you know going to business school helped and how you landed here today. Uh, yeah, let's hear about that. Well, so my mother started the company in 1973, the year I was born. So we're 47 years old. And she, her goal ultimately was not to have me take over. It was to sell the company, build it and sell. And she had an opportunity. And unfortunately, it fell through. And she called me about a month later. I was living in LA. I was working in the movie business. I mean, it's so ridiculous. It's like this bizarro world career that I had going on as a, as a set designer or art department coordinator in feature film, she calls and says, Hey, we'll have the company pay for you to go to rice, get your MBA, come work for, for Savage for two years. And let me know if you want to take the business over ultimately. And I was not going to pass up a free education. So it did not take much convincing, packed my bags, drove to Houston and the rest is history, so to speak. But I will say what is really cool if I just think about this journey is one, I had no intention of ever being in my mother's business. Here I am. She thought of me, she wanted me to go to Rice because it was close to the office and she wanted me to you know, be here. And when I was at Rice, I was in Al Napier's class and uh, I, for whatever reason, Al Napier in entrepreneurship class was teaching us how to design our own websites. So this is before LinkedIn that dates me. And I'm sitting there going, oh my God, I am learning to design my own website. And so are all of these students. And this is what my company does for a living. So we really were a graphic design company. We did a lot of you know logos and websites and brochures and in your reports. And I was sitting in Al's class and I had this epiphany, which was we're being commoditized. So I switched pretty quickly my direction at Rice and started studying corporate strategy, more entrepreneurship, marketing, knowing that when I came into Savage, not only was I just going to learn my mom's business, but I was going to have to reinvent the business. So that's when we started taking on a lot more 
strategy capability in the company and started reading up and finding philosophically who we really wanted to be and then aligned what we did to who we want to be. So now, you know, 20 years ago, graphic design, branding company, now half of our business is about helping leaders, you know, encouraging leaders and helping them articulate their purpose, mission, vision, values, and behaviors, and helping them activate that within their cultures. So it's such a difference from going to half of our business being about annual reports to shareholders, like you mentioned, right? And now 50% is oriented around building a really great differentiated culture for a company. One of the things I, I as I was doing my LinkedIn stalking on you, I couldn't help but notice your book. If, let's see if I get it right. Uh, get your head out of your bottom line. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love telling a bunch of MBAs what my book title is. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that intersect with your, your business? Is it completely separate? Obviously it's not, it's, you know, it's a leading question, but um, you know, how does that intersect with your business and um, uh, if at all, or is that a totally separate venture uh, from Savage Brands? Oh no, it's, it's totally related. And the, <laughs> the truth is when we were reading, you know, Simon Sinek, Start With Why, great book uh, and great TED Talk, by the way, and we were inspired by what he had to say. The problem is that all of the examples that were given were of B2C companies and we deal with B2B companies. So we were saying to ourselves, well, how do we do this? How do we take a company that's traditional, very successful, not broken, and transform them into being purpose-led brands. And we want to do this with B2B. And we had nothing to work from. We wrote the book as we learned how to do it ourselves. And it's been it's been great for us because it's so intensely focused on B2B because in our world we believe that people are your brand, especially in a B2B company. Wow. Okay. Last question. And this is choose your own adventure. And the only requirement here is you have to uh, start the answer with owl, have you know, uh, if you could go back in time and teach your younger version of yourself, one thing that you now know that you didn't know previously, what would that be? Or second question would be, what's the most important thing that you want folks to know, um, especially in the rice business uh, community, want them to know about the most important thing about your journey? Well, it, it may actually answer both, but I'll have you know that my network from Rice is the single most value that I got from my experience there. And it continues to be a gift. And I have so much gratitude for that. And I think looking back had I known how important that network of people were going to be as friends, as colleagues, as clients, as suppliers, et cetera, that I would have paid a lot more attention in school to the development of some of those relationships. And I would have done a lot more reaching out with questions to the alumni base because they'll always answer the phone. And I think that we tend to be a little shy um, or embarrassed to do that first reach out. And I would have started that a lot earlier in my, in my career. I mean, think about it. I would trust anybody that graduated with a Rice MBA over somebody else that I met off the street. So mm. it just says something about the total character of the school and everyone that's graduated from it. Okay. We're going to drop the mic there because we can't make it any better than what you just said. <laughs> now we know each other. Yeah. And now we're in a network together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, this is how it works, right? This is right. real time, right? You know, so <laughs> Bethany, thank you so much. I enjoy this immensely. And I hope folks that are listening to um, do as well. And uh, please give us feedback. Uh, this is a inaugural journey and just started the podcast. We hope to invite many, many more folks and to keep this going for quite a while. So your feedback would be very useful. So again, my name is David Drew Gleaver, your host of Owl Have You Know. And uh, this is uh, Bethany Andel, uh, um, president of Savage Brands, the fearless leader and president of the board of directors as well. So Bethany, thank you so much. And we're going to do this again. Sounds good. Thank you, David. This has been I'll Have You Know. Thanks for listening. You can find links and more information about our guests, hosts, and announcements on our website, business.rice.edu. Please subscribe to this podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts and leave us a comment while you're at it. And let us know what you think. 
I'll Have You Know is a production of Rice Business and is sponsored by the Rice Business Alumni Board. The hosts of I'll Have You Know are myself, Christine Dobbin, and David Drew Gleaver. 